Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark. We have finished the first chapter. We're beginning the second chapter. Our text is verses 1 through 12. Jesus has been on a preaching tour of Galilee. He has healed a lot of people. In fact, earlier in the, uh, or at the latter part of the uh, second, uh, the first chapter, the crowds had gathered on a Sunday evening, or rather a, uh, a Saturday evening when the Sabbath had ended, and he healed a number of people. And then the next morning he rose early after healing all these numbers of people, and the disciples were looking for him because he'd been praying for some hours. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. In other words, the crowds are gathering for more healing. And Jesus responded, in verse 38, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. It's a great lesson in that. That is the mission of the church. It's to preach the Word of God. It's not to heal people physically. Physical things are important, but the heart of it all is right there. Preaching the word. And that's what he did. He went about preaching in Galilee and went to their synagogues and was doing that, proclaiming and teaching the word. And that will continue in chapter 2. That tour ends and we read in verse 1, when he came back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, being able, unable to get, in, get to him because the, of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying together. Let's pray. The late... Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia was known for writing colorful dissents and being, as someone put it, a man who swam each day against the tide. So one of his many memorable statements is, a man who has made no enemies is probably not a very good man. At the end of chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, Jesus had no enemies. Wherever he went, he drew large crowds. The chapter ends with him unable to enter cities publicly because of his popularity. That changes in chapter 2 when Jesus forgave a man's sins. Religious men witnessed it and were scandalized. Who can forgive sins but God alone, they said. It was blasphemy, they thought. And that made enemies for Jesus. 
From then on, opposition would only build until he was rejected by the nation and nailed to a cross because he forgave sins. I think it's a true statement that a man who has made no enemies is probably not a very good man when that man or woman is reviled for truth. That was Jesus. But he backed up his amazing claims with equally amazing actions. That's the lesson of our text, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, that Jesus can forgive because he is God. And he proved it by his deeds. But in a broad application of that to ourselves, the passage also teaches that our deeds will prove who we are. They will prove the reality of our forgiveness. That's illustrated here by the man Jesus healed and then commanded to walk. We too are commanded to walk according to the Lord's commands. And if we are forgiven, we will. Chapter 2 begins with Jesus returning home from his preaching tour of Galilee. He had preached in synagogues, cast out demons, and healed sick people. So when it was learned that he was back in town, the crowds gathered at the house and they were so large that according to verse 2, there was no longer room, not even near the door. That was a problem for five men. One was a paralytic who was being carried by his four friends. They brought him to Jesus for healing, but the door was blocked. These were determined men. If they couldn't enter through the door, then they would make a door. That's what they did. They carried their friend up onto the roof. Now, to make sense of that, it's necessary to know that houses in the Middle East were small structures with flat roofs and a stairway on the outside of the house that went to the rooftop. That is still the case in many houses in modern Israel, especially Arab homes. A lot of activity takes place on the rooftop. The roof of an ancient house was usually made of wooden beams with thatch and compacted earth in order to shed the rain. And sometimes the, there, there were tiles that were laid between the beams and between the, the thatch and the compacted earth. And uh, that seems to be the construction of this house, something like that. What happened on the roof left a deep impression on Peter, who was Mark's collaborator in writing this second gospel. It made an impression on him because he was likely the owner of the house. They dug a hole in the roof so they could lower their friend down into the room below. Actually, the events here made an impression on Matthew and Luke as well because they too recorded the incident. The, the fact that three Gospels recorded it is proof of how significant it was. The love and determination of the four friends is impressive. It, it, it is an example and a lesson in and of itself. They were resourceful in finding a way to get the help their friend needed. They would not be denied. They, the, the, these four were true friends, and as I say, there's a lesson in that for us, what friendship is like. But what is really important, the, the reason for the importance of this incident is not what they did, but what Jesus did. As he preached to a full house, noise was heard from above, Next, clay and, and dust and thatch began falling down from the ceiling. Then a man on a bed dropped down in front of Jesus. It was a disturbance. It interrupted the sermon. It, it must have upset some of those who were there. Maybe the, the disciples were upset. They would later get perturbed with parents for bringing their children to Jesus. We find that in chapter 10. 
Well, as you can imagine, that uh, this might have upset some people, and imagine that the, uh, the, the man, as he's on this, this bed, looks out on this audience and sees some angry looks and some startled looks at him. But the Lord wasn't taken back or disturbed or uh, distracted at all by the interruption. He was calm. He was actually pleased by what occurred. In fact, it was his response that caused the strongest reaction. It surprised some and shocked others. We read in verse 5, And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Well, Matthew gave a fuller account of the Lord's statement. Jesus said, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus must have seen some anxiety in the man's eyes, maybe because the man saw hostile looks from the crowd or, or thought that Jesus himself might be angry, or as some have thought, the man felt the guilt of sin. Perhaps he was paralyzed due to a sin that he had committed. Some sickness is the result of sin. Paul speaks of that in Romans chapter 1, verse 27, of certain ones receiving in their person the due penalty of their error. And the fact that Jesus speaks of sin first may indicate that, that sin was the problem and the problem that was foremost on the man's mind. But that's not stated to be the case here. In fact, in John chapter 9, verse 3, when Jesus healed the blind man, he corrected the notion that every sickness or malady or affliction was the direct result of, the person's, of a person's sin that they had done something that caused this or merited that. Not every misfortune is due directly to a personal sin. But all suffering is ultimately the consequence of sin, of Adam's sin. We live as a result of that in a fallen world. Things are not as God originally designed them to be. They need to be put right. They need to be restored. That is why Christ came. He came to do that. He came to remove the source of the world's ills and of our personal guilt and condemnation by making atonement for sin, by paying for sin and in so doing, removing it. Alexander McLaren wrote, the taproot of all misery is sin. And until it is grubbed up, hacking at the branches is a sad waste of time. Jesus didn't come to hack at branches, but to root up sin. He would do that at the cross, which is the only solution for sin. So he disarmed the man's fear. He spoke kindly to him. Then, on the basis of his future work on the cross, he said, your sins are forgiven. No greater statement can be spoken or heard than that. Your sins are forgiven. It was a statement of grace, a statement of sovereign grace. But what opened the gate of grace was something he saw in that man and those who brought him there, faith. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Faith is necessary. But whose faith? Because on the face of it, it might seem that Jesus saw the faith of the four who carried their friend to the house and had the resourcefulness to dig up the roof and lower him down. In fact, William Barclay, who wrote... Uh, popular series of commentaries on the New Testament, in fact I quoted him last week, said, here is a wonderful picture of a man who was saved by the faith of his friends. Really? Why is that? There is no indication that seeing their faith didn't include the paralytic 
In fact, we would assume he had agreed to be brought to Jesus, that he had agreed to be lowered down through the roof, that he'd agreed to everything, that he was a willing participant in all of this. That, in fact, is consistent with the teaching of Scripture, that an individual's faith is the means of obtaining blessing, not the faith of others. We're not saved through the faith of our friends or our fathers or because of any spiritual blessing that we might be born into. There is no greater blessing a child can have, that anyone can have, than being born into a believing home, a Christian home, and have the privilege of hearing the Bible taught, of being instructed by godly parents, of being brought to church, of being trained up in the grace and the admonition of the Lord. That is a, 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 a blessing beyond compare. It's better than gold and silver. It's better than riches. It's better than anything. But that doesn't save. There must be a response. Forgiveness results from a personal response to the good news. Faith in the gospel. Well, Jesus saw faith in these five men, the paralytic included. He saw it in their actions. He saw it perhaps in their hearts. The context of this passage might suggest that because he sees the thinking, the hearts of these scribes later on. So he sees their faith. He knows they are believing men. So he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. The Lord had done amazing things so far in his brief ministry, casting out demons, healing a fevered brow, cleansing a leper of leprosy. He has authority over spirits and sickness. But here he went beyond all of that and declared that he has authority over sin. It was an, an astonishing statement. To the five men, it may have been a surprising statement. I can imagine that they came hoping to hear the words, you are healed. Instead, they heard, you are forgiven. They may not have understood the significance of that at the moment, but what they heard was, in fact, the greatest blessing they could have hoped for or even imagined. But to others who were there and heard it, it was not a blessing but a blasphemy. The scribes, they began asking the question, who can forgive? The scribes were lawyers. They were legal authorities. They weren't legal authorities in Roman law or the, the, the laws that governed the empire. They may have known about all of that, but they were, they were legal authorities in regard to the law of Moses. They were authorities in regard to the laws and the rules that governed the lives of the Jewish people. And from the law, they were thinking and they were asking themselves, not out loud, but reasoning in their hearts, how he could make such a statement. Verse 7, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they were right about that. Man cannot absolve a person of guilt. The church cannot do that. Priests and popes and church councils can't take away sin. Not even the law can do that. We can forgive in the sense that we resolve to forget an offense and no longer hold it against the offender or decide not to take vengeance. But only God can forgive in the sense of removing sin and guilt. So for a mere man to go about claiming to have authority over sin and the ability to remove it and make people right with God, innocent of their crimes, is blasphemy. Jesus didn't dispute that. What he challenges is the objection that he didn't have the authority to do it. What he challenges is their assumption that he isn't God. 
He was challenging the assumption, the denial in their minds that this carpenter was their maker. But he was. And he could forgive sin because he was their creator. He is God incarnate. That's what he would next demonstrate. In fact, before he did, he spoke to them in a way that showed that he who said your sins are forgiven was no ordinary man. He knew their unspoken thoughts. And he said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Now that, that must have given them pause and made each wonder, how, how did he know what I was thinking? Well, the question answers itself. The Lord God alone searches all hearts. And he alone understands the intents of everyone's thoughts. He knows our motives. He knows what's going on within us. But rather than, than acknowledge their surprise, they probably put on a puzzled look as if to say, what are you talking about? But they knew he had exposed them and he knew that they knew. They had dismissed him as a mere man and one that they didn't much like. He blasphemed, they said. He was an enemy. Christ couldn't ignore this, so having revealed the secret of their hearts, he answered their question, who can forgive sins but God alone, with a question of his own. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? Well, on the face of it, of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. That is a non-falsifiable statement. In other words, there's no way you can prove it to be false. The reality is neither statement is easier. Both are impossible. They are equally a work of God. But saying get up and walk to the paralytic is a falsifiable statement it's easy to verify. Either it happens or it doesn't. If the paralytic couldn't get up, obviously the command and the point was false. And so to prove to these skeptical scribes that he has authority to do the one to forgive sins, he did the other. He healed the lame. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And that's what he did. He got up and immediately, Mark wrote, picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Well, they'd never seen anything like the healing of a paralytic and the forgiving of his sins. They were amazed. Now the, the crowd was amazed, but it stopped short of confessing that Jesus was God, but the miracle showed what Mark confessed him to be at the very beginning of this gospel, in the very first verse of this gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, Jesus didn't call himself that. He called himself the Son of Man. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the man to walk. This is the first time that he used this term, Son of Man, of himself. It was first time in, in this gospel. It was his favorite title in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, he uses it 14 times to speak of himself. It's a significant title. And the significance of it is seen in its origin in the book of Daniel, Daniel 7, where it refers to the Messiah. Daniel had a vision in which he saw a person on the clouds of heaven. He said, like a son of man, who came up to the Ancient of Days, who promised him glory and a kingdom that is everlasting. So, the Son of Man is a man. 
but he is also from heaven. The Son of Man is the Son of God. And because he is God, he has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Sin is the root problem of the human condition. We uh, were shocked by the events we saw yesterday on the news, what occurred in London, and what seems to be a recurring event all over the Western world. It's not unusual. Things like this have gone on from the beginning and will continue to go on from the beginning because the root is of that problem is this problem of sin. This problem separates man from God first and foremost. We're alienated from God. We're in rebellion against God. It's what then divides the human race against itself. And it's what divides an individual against himself or herself. Only Christ can deliver a person from the scourge of sin and from its penalty, and its penalty is eternal. And the miracle of the healing of the paralytic was proof of it. Proof that he is God. That, that is the main lesson of the passage and incident. That Jesus Christ is God the Son who can indeed forgive sin. But more broadly, this, this whole incident illustrates the experience of salvation for everyone. It gives a clear picture of man's helplessness to, to save himself and God's sovereign work in doing it. Spiritually, we are all paralytic. See yourself in this individual. We are unable to bring ourselves to Christ for help. We haven't the strength. We haven't the ability. We don't even have the desire. In and of ourselves, we do not want that. In and of ourselves, we don't see a problem. Paul describes us all in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, as being dead in our trespasses and sins. But alive in rebellion, walking according to the course of this world and the devil. In other words, we are dead to God and the things of God. But, Paul goes on to say, God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Do these things appeal to you? Does the Word of God speak to your soul? It's because God has made you alive. He's done that work. The only reason we come to Christ, the only reason we seek and believe in Him is because of God, because He is rich in mercy and grace and He brings us to Himself. He invigorates us with spiritual life, understanding, and faith. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But it is a work that God does through the efforts of men as they give the gospel and tell others of Christ. The Lord is in that. The Lord works through that, through the Word of God. That's another lesson the four friends give. They picture evangelism. They brought their friend to Jesus for physical healing. When we tell others of salvation in Christ, we're really doing, by analogy, the same thing. We are seeking to bring them to Him for spiritual healing. What those men did, they did as an act of love and faith. Love and faith are active. They reach out. Christians care about the souls of men and are active in bringing the gospel to them and bringing them to Jesus Christ and to healing and to life. And the Lord is so willing to receive sinners. We see it in his response to the paralytic. It was an awkward moment. The man dropped out of the ceiling and disrupted the meeting. But what is the first thing the Lord says? It says, son. Now, literally, the word is child. You have that probably in the margin of your, of your uh, Bible. Uh, 
I suspect that it's translated son because this is not a, this was a young man, not a child, and, and to say son expresses that more clearly. That word child, it seems to me, uh, has a more empathetic and warm, warm aspect to it. Uh, but that's the point. He speaks in a way that shows his concern and his, his interest in this individual. He speaks in a way that calmed the young man and expressed genuine joy at seeing him. He welcomed him as his child, as his son. Oh, there was no joy among the scribes. But nothing gives the Lord and nothing gives heaven more joy than a sinner coming to Christ for healing, for salvation. That's, that's what heaven rejoices when, when one of the hundred sheep is found. What a reassuring response this is that the Lord gave, the assurance that no one who comes to him will be turned away. He will cast none out. All who want forgiveness will receive it from Christ. Again, the main lesson of this passage is that Jesus Christ is God. Not God the Father, not God the Spirit, God the Son. The second person of the Trinity, but fully God. He can forgive sins and does. He proved it when he told the lame man to walk, and he did. But in that command and, and the man's response is a further lesson that applies to us because it teaches that our actions prove who we are, prove the reality of our forgiveness. Anyone can say that he or she is forgiven. Those are words. Anyone can say those. But do they walk? Do they follow the Lord's instruction or walk according to the world? The evidence of our forgiveness is our behavior. This is what James said in James chapter 2 and verse 17. Faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, if you are forgiven, then you are alive. And if alive, your life will be seen in your life, in your actions, in your deeds. We will walk and we will walk according to the Lord, not according to the world. Now that doesn't mean perfect obedience. We, uh, we will never live perfectly, never in this life. We will never be perfect until we depart this world or until the Lord comes into this world and we see Him face to face and we'll be transformed and changed at that moment. We will be perfect. But as long as we're in this life, in this world as it is now, we will fail and fail often. In fact, I would say we will fail every minute of every day. We never do anything perfect. I've quoted this before the source I was given was Robert Murray McShane. I've read his writings and remains, and I didn't find the quote there. I found a similar quote from someone else, but it's a great quote nonetheless, and I'll attribute it to McShane, who's one of my heroes of the faith. But he said, I even repent of the tears of my repentance. And I said, what does that mean? Well, even my repentance isn't perfect. Nothing we do is we will fail and fail often. When we are born again, we, we enter the arena and the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. That's the reality. We're in the conflict every day and every minute of the day. That's our life. That's the Christian life. Now, I don't want to make too much of a detail, but the image of this man carrying his pallet as he walked suggests that, that even as we walk in obedience, we always have the reminder of our past life. Paul speaks emotionally of his spiritual struggle in Romans 7, 
and of his failure and frustration. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, the good that I want I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Now that's the universal experience of the child of God. And yet, the very struggle itself is the evidence of life. Proof that we are combatants fighting sin, which the unbeliever doesn't do. None of this should suggest to you that works are necessary for salvation. They are not. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians 2 verse 9. That's just one place where he makes it clear. But then he makes the point that salvation is not as a result of works. In fact, once we wed, we put together faith as necessary for justification. We put works and faith together as being necessary for that. Then the gospel is lost. It's another gospel, Paul said, and not another. That's what he said in the book of Galatians. That's what that book is about. What the gospel is not. It's not about works of any kind, the works of the law. Even one work, even if that work is circumcision or baptism, that corrupts the gospel. No, it's not. Justification is not faith plus works in any form. But Galatians 5.22 does speak of the fruit of the Spirit, which every child of God has, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. He goes on, nine virtues, and, and we could add more than the, to, to that than the nine. Christians will have that. To varying degrees, but they will have that. They will bear fruit in their lives. Love and kindness and righteousness as well as strength and struggling that often ends in defeat but continues on. Like this man who was healed, when the Lord commands us to walk, we walk. We, we will carry our bed, so to speak, which which makes the walk difficult, but we will obey. We will walk according to His will. And that is a witness to the world of what Christ can do for the helpless and guilty sinner. He can make us whole. He gives us freedom from both the penalty and the power of sin. We represent Christ in this world, and we represent Him in our words, when we give the gospel to others, and in our works, in the way we live. It is the best way to live. It's not the way, it's not the way of the world and the temptations of the world, and it's all so alluring, and it seems so wise and sophisticated to take a different path. But you read the Proverbs, and many of you are studying the Proverbs now. You see the right path. You see wisdom. It's the wise way to live, the way of the Lord. It's the blessed way to live and the best way to live, following the Lord's instruction, following His will. It is the way to a life of peace, peace within, but peace with other men, believers and non-believers alike. It's what Paul encourages in, in Romans 12 and verse 18. As far as it's possible with us, we're to live at peace with all men. We're to do that. And living a righteous life will produce that, will produce a life of peace among men. And yet, paradoxically, it is also the way to make enemies of the world because the life of obedience is the way of the cross. It is fixing our, our minds on Him and making that the priority, not the priorities of men. It, it is living and speaking the gospel, and the world hates that. But then, as the judge said, a man who has made no enemies is probably not a very good man. Jesus made enemies by forgiving sin. And we will make enemies by telling others of forgiveness in Him. G. Campbell Morgan wrote of hearing the president of the London Missionary Society ask the question, what is Christianity? What is the distinctive message we proclaim to people? 
The answer he gave was simple. The message we proclaim is the forgiveness of sins. There's no greater message in the world. It's the message we preach from this pulpit have for 50 years plus. Do you want the forgiveness of sins? If you're here without Christ, you need them. There's no greater act of love than doing that, than telling you and telling others there's forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ. And so if you have not believed in him, he's the answer. Look to Christ. Trust in him. He receives all who do. Is that not a great truth? Is that not a great blessing? Every sinner that comes to him, he receives joyfully. So come to him. And you who have, realize you're a son, you're a child. And by God's grace, walk in a way that's worthy of him. Father, we do thank you for sending your son, your eternal son, into this world that he became a man. The Son of God is the Son of Man, and He died in our place so that He is a wonderful, merciful Savior. The triune God is. We give you praise and pray, Lord, enable us to walk, walk in a way that pleases you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.